Welcome. And hey, guys. Hey. <laughs> What's up? Welcome back to I Bet You Think This Podcast Is About You. Uh, and if you think this podcast is about you, uh, it isn't. It's about us. And all of the women in people of the world who have survived relationships with individuals who have cluster B personality disorders or who we believe may have cluster B personality disorders because we are not mental health experts. Um, we're just regular run-of-the-mill women who have been in relationships um, within our families or in dating relationships or in the workplace with individuals that we believe suffer from these personality disorders uh, and who have survived the re those relationships and learned or lived to tell the tale. Barely. Barely. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I have scars to prove it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, welcome to episode three, The Elevator Pitch. And the... Um, Impetus for for this episode is a story that it seems like every single one of us have. We were sitting around having some drinks with friends recently, and we all started talking about rides in elevators with men. So why don't you share your story, Em? Oh, I would love to. Um, so... <clears throat> The yeah, like uh, as I'd mentioned, the title of this podcast is the elevator pitch and the overall theme. So we're going to tell our stories. Uh, so sit back and relax. Uh, but the overall theme of this particular episode is going to be revolved around uh, the patriarchy and how we believe the patriarchy in general has helped to create and also sustain uh, narcissism and some some of these cluster B personality disorders. So my fabulous story. Uh, <laughs> so happened a couple of years ago. By fabul fabulous, you mean terrible? I, well, I did, yes, one hundred percent. And anyway, so I, I work in a very male dominated um, uh, system, if you will, and I'm I'm in sales and I sell to a lot of men. And um, one of the things that we oftentimes do as an organization twice a year, we hold these conferences, and uh, they're in you know different cities and. So this one year, I got like 20 of my um, clients to come with me, and there was this one in particular who is, it's interesting because when I first met him, and I've known him now for like five years, but when I first met him, he was horrible to me. Just, I mean, I, he, and, and like we've talked about before with these people with personality disorders, they have these weird unspoken rules. They don't tell you what the rules are, but it's like, you're kind of always on eggshells. So I was like, oh, I don't know how to be with this person. And like, he's so <laughs> awful to me. And and then throughout the course of, of time, um, he developed, a, I don't know if it was a, a newfound respect or whatever happened. And we actually- It wasn't respect. Nope. I, yeah. I <laughs> thought I'd just see if I went with that. <laughs> just try that there. I don't know what it was, but he he's, he changed his demeanor towards me. And now after you hear my elevator story, you'll probably realize why. I think it was just part of the, uh, maybe the love bombing stage. I don't know. It's also important to note that he was not single and I knew his significant other well. Um, so fast forward to he is coming to this conference and he continuously is texting me. He goes, hey, I, like we, we're going to go out for dinner. You know, what are we going to do? And I made it very clear that, you know, as a female uh, in the industry, I don't typically ever do things with men alone after like five. Like it, we can go out with my my boss or with a group of people, but actually because of the patriarchy and probably some other things, unfortunately, if a female is seen with a male professionally, like I will look bad. I could potentially look bad. Stories could be said about me. Oh, she's just trying to get business or whatever. So I made it very clear to him that I wasn't comfortable with that particular scenario. Well, you wouldn't leave it alone. Wouldn't leave it alone. So we're at the conference, you know, but then I'm finally, long story short, I was like, okay, fine. Let, that's fine. Let's just go. He wanted to talk about some business things. So I said, I'll just meet you outside of the lobby. And we went. And the dinner was fine. I mean, it, it wasn't, he basically spent the entire time, though, weirdly talking about himself. Like, like there was no Shocker. business. I know, right? I, <laughs> I, I, like, I'm sitting here like, oh my gosh, this is really, like, but these weird things, like, I did this and then I had this accomplishment. Did he tell you how much he could bench press? I mean, basically, yeah. I, I don't want to get too many specifics away, but like basically, <laughs> essentially, that's really what it was about. And I'm just like, this feels like a, in the back of my mind, I'm like, why does this feel like a date? Like this, what is going on right now? So, mm -hmm. but it was like, oh, whatever, fine. And then we're walking back and we get to the hotel 
and we both are in the elevator together. And in this particular elevator, if you want to get off at your floor, you have to take your little key fob and like kind of swipe it against the little thing, right? Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden, unbeknownst to me, he just stands in front of it and he kind of like crosses his arms and like does this thing with his legs and he's like, you realize that you're not going, or no, no, he goes, you realize that you're coming up to my room with me, right? <sighs> and I like, so my response, I just started laughing. I was like, what? <laughs> like, I'm sitting here like, uh, you know, because you're kind of in shock. And also my my blood pressure and my heart rate and everything has started to go up because I'm like, oh my God, like I might miss my floor. Like this guy could overpower me for sure. And I just literally was like, uh, no, I'm not. I'm going to my room. And he still wouldn't move. And then, like, I think part, when these sort of weirdly traumatic things happen, we kind of forget things because I don't really re- what I don't remember what happened next. But all I know is that all of a sudden he moved away. I did get off on my floor, but then I turned around, and as before the doors were, the doors were going to close, he just basically kind of sat there with this like studly sort of look. Which <laughs> yes, you know it was not studly, but I know you thought it was. <laughs> and he was like, "Room, you know, whatever, nine twenty-five when you're ready." And no, I never, I'll like, be ready, gross. never. Ew. So I went back into my room, traumatized. You know, I know his partner really well, and I'm like, I can't believe this just. Well, actually, I can believe it just happened. But, and then I get a text message yep. from him from a different phone. Oh, and he was like, you know, this is my other cell phone number. Why do you have another cell phone? Exactly. That's yeah. weird. Right. So I'm just like, oh, here we go again. And then at the end of the story, uh, the next morning I saw him and basically he said, so, you know, uh, what happened last night? Like, you know, my partner doesn't know about any of this. Just don't don't say anything. Like, that's your job. Yeah. So I basically felt threatened in more than one way, like threatened in in the elevator, but then God forbid I, I say anything and warn this poor woman of the monster that she's in a relationship with. But I was, I mean, he did. He's, he, it was terrifying. So that that's that's my elevator story. And um, do you want to say yours? Or do you want to? Sure, I'll okay. share mine too. Mine's a little very similar, as a matter of fact. <laughs> Shocker! I know, right? <laughs> All of the same tactics. <clears throat> You know, I think they watch too many movies or something, and they think this is a great come on. But I was at a black tie event, as a matter of fact, and I went out after the black tie event with um, several colleagues and friends, including this guy who, honest to God, is old enough to be my father. And um, we, I, I went to leave, and I went to my parking ramp, um, and I had had way too much to drink, I'll be honest. <laughs> I drink a lot. And I decided, you know, I'm going to go to my car and I'm getting my key to go back into my office to take a little nap in my office before I drove home because it was pre-Uber days and I was super responsible or at least, you know, not going to get a DUI on a Monday night, right? <laughs> so, or ever because they're terrible. Especially on a Monday. <laughs> that is low class yeah. to get a DUI on a Monday. <laughs> so... I went back to my, I was going back to my parking ramp because, you know, black tie event, I have the tiniest purse ever and don't have my keys to my office on me. And this guy's like, I'll walk you to your car. I park in your ramp too. I'm like, you know, okay. It's like, you know, stones throw away, but all right, be a gentleman. And we get into the elevator and I, honest to God, I was so drunk, but he pushes me up against the corner of the elevator and just starts like, making out with me and like groping me and I don't same as you like I don't remember Mm -hmm. exactly how far he went with me but I'm like dude only had like 30 seconds like how long are you in an elevator for Mm -hmm. (laughs) um and I don't even know if I put up that much of a fight because I was so I was shocked Mm -hmm. and intoxicated yeah and you know you're gonna walk me back to my car didn't include you getting to molest me on the elevator for 30 minutes or 30 seconds or whatever that was. Um, And I just remember being very taken aback by it. Um, This is a colleague of mine, and I work in a very male-dominated industry too, just like yours, just like Mm -hmm. yours. Um, And I didn't know who to tell because at the time I was pretty low on the totem pole and he was really high up in his, you know, we were not at the same business or the same company. Um, And I knew if I told some of my colleagues, they would have never believed me or they would have just been told me to shut up about it Um, because there's, you know, professional working relationships with this guy. But I'm just, you know, 
the next day was crazy. I didn't get a text that night. I got a phone call in my office the next day. And I was, I couldn't believe he had the audacity to call me as though it was like this consensual, amazing thing that I was just all about, not completely drunk out of my mind. And I just remember saying, (laughs) aren't you married? (laughs) Because I don't know that much about him, but I vaguely remember him being married. And I said, dude, if aren't I, you? I'm sorry, but if I had a dollar for every time I said that to a guy, yeah. I, I could retire tomorrow. Yes. I, I mean, oh my gosh. <laughs> you know what he said? He said, of course, what they always say, <clears throat> well, you know, technically, but it's a terrible marriage and I'm getting a divorce and blah, 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 blah. All of the bullshit after that is not true, by the way. <laughs> every word after yes is a lie. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but <laughs> litany of lies. <laughs> and it was just, I, you know, same thing. So, um, you know, I have to still work professionally with this person. So I was like, well, I guess I'll meet you for lunch like later, you know, and he, and it's just, he had this whole spin story and it was the same thing. Don't tell anybody, just don't tell anybody. And why is that my job? Why is that my responsibility to not shed light on the fact that you're basically a dick? And, but I didn't, you know, right. I kept it to myself and I'm just like, why, why, is, why would I do that? And when we talked about this with some friends of ours, every single one of them had an elevator story. Why in the elevator? Um, and that's Especially where I, because they're cameras. I mean, that's what I thought too. Like they don't care. They, well, they don't. It's just so. And, you know, and it's why we think, you know, the real question is why they think they can get away with it. Yep. And the reason is it's that it's the patriarchy. It's that the system was set up to allow that sort of behavior and not um, hold them accountable for it. And that's what we have to operate within. I mean, I wonder all the time why um, narcissism seems to be an an epidemic, particularly among men. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think it's because we have a whole system that's built to support them and built to hide their bad behavior Mm -hmm. Um, and and, and, and built to keep us quiet. Right. Right. And, you know, that's that's the system. Now I find myself, um, this most recent relationship that I've had, trying to break free from um, is fighting these constant attacks and different levels of people trying to silence me right. and tell me that I don't have a right to tell my story or I don't have a right to... This is my favorite. I... <laughs> I was recently told by a colleague of mine who also is old enough to be my father, considers himself a third party. He said, and I'll give you a little background. Um, My most recent narcissist, the the absolute sociopath crazy person that I dumped recently, um, did something egregious, like terrible. (laughs) And here I am, you know, um, either fortunately or unfortunately, and and it's probably a mix of both, caught him doing something that was really, really bad, (laughs) like really bad. And I was in a position where, um, a, I had to leave the relationship, and B, I had a moral obligation to do something about his behavior, um, which sucked. Like, fuck him for putting me in that position, mm-hmm. right? Like, can't you can't you just be a dick? Why do you have to be like <laughs> a, someone who like That's he's literally harming thick. other people that aren't just me? Yeah. Um, and I was pulled aside by a mutual colleague of ours who's some old man and he said do you really want to ruin his life and his family's lives and I'm like hey two problems with that theory right (laughs) number one who ruined whose life like I didn't do this to him you know and number two um why is his life intrinsically more valuable than mine what about me and that's the thing when I said that to this guy I'll call him John when I told John what about me I'm like oh my god I said that every minute of every day inside the relationship. Mm -hmm. When we were together, it was all about his needs and his wants and his everything. And I don't know how many times I would ask him, what about me? Mm -hmm. Where do I fit in here? Right. Nowhere. Right. But, well, I mean, that's if you look at patriarchy, what's included in that is like superiority is such a big part of it. And that men, and I just think it's sort of inherent in society. They just don't even, it just sort of happens. I mean, I grew up from my earliest memories thinking that men were superior to me as a female. And why do you think they can treat you the way that they did and the, the way that they treated me? They they genuinely feel inherently that they're superior to women. And that's part of the patriarchy. 
superiority, entitlement, lack of emotion, I think, is really big, too. Well, yeah, I know. So, yeah, little boys are always taught you shouldn't have emotion. You should be tough yeah. and strong. And right. we aren't taught that, right? So we, our mothers don't teach us to lack mm-hmm. emotion. They teach us to tap into it. And and as, as, you know, kids get older and we we will go out into the workplace, the fact that we're emotional and we're in touch with our emotions is somehow seen as weaker. Mm-hmm. And I think that's not true, right? I mean, how stunted are people who can't tap right. into the fact that something makes them... Any emotion other than angry. <laughs> well, right? that's, that's what a narcissist, I mean, if you look at any emotion that narcissists do exhibit, it's typically anger and rage. And it actually sort of makes sense not to justify their behavior. But if if they're taught, and like to your point, a lot of narcissists tend to be men. If they're taught at a very early age to take your feelings and stuff them down and stuff them down, well, what happens? I mean, we li- we work in a male-dominated society. I've also had to shove my feelings down. And what happens? I get freaking pissed. Yeah. I get angry because they need to come out. And so then that's, I think, part of how the patriarchy has sort of created and sustained these narcissistic behaviors. Because guess what? It's totally okay if a guy is angry. It's okay if they're angry, if they show rage. That's like normal male behavior. Um, and I think that that's that's part of how these personality disorders develop. It's very like multifactorial, well, but and they're gosh. also taught to be competitive. This competition, this yeah. is American male one hundred and one. Yeah. is competition, 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 and it is. The, I think that what creates so much narcissism in America is that we have these men who are taught that everything's a competition. So basically, they have to have. Everything everybody else has. Mm. Nothing that they have is good enough because someone will always have something better, right? And this is, you know, the the false God thing, right? So, I mean, I had this discussion with my ex a million times because he was the guy who chased everything, chased money, chased status, chased cars, chased women, not really realizing how much he did that until later, but okay, that's a whole other story. <laughs> that's a whole other podcast. Um, and just chased after everything everyone else had because no matter how much he had, he didn't have enough. Mm-hmm. And I said, you know what? You're doing that. You'll never be happy because no matter how much you have, someone will have more. Someone will have better and bigger and faster and stronger, and you will never be the best. So, But you, they can't let that go. And when someone else has a newer car or a hotter wife, then they get angry. Mm-hmm. Because that should be them. They're better than that guy. They got a they had a higher SAT score, or they caught a seventy five yard football pass. I don't even know shit about football. Maybe that's not even good. I don't know. But they did something better than that guy one time, and they are entitled to something better than mm-hmm. than him. And it's that constant chase in in race to get to get better and to get more than their neighbor or whoever else. Mm-hmm. Um, that makes them tr- start treating everything in their life like a pawn, including yeah. women, including people. Your kid has to be more successful and smarter and better at sports than the neighbor kid. And it's it's sad because, you know, all they ever do is chase and chase and chase. And I'm like, you'll never get anything and you'll never be happy and you'll never be fulfilled because mm-hmm. you've been taught to pursue things that don't actually give you any value. Right. And they definitely don't make you happy. Oh, my gosh. Right. You ever met a happy guy with a Lamborghini? <laughs> Not me. I've met really annoying guys with Lamborghinis. I'm like, I've oh. met some dudes with Lamborghinis, and none of them are happy. Oh. It's actually such a turnoff for me when I like it. If you like nice cars, like that's fine. But it's just, ugh, no. It just it drives me crazy. Well, and then I have to think I was thinking about some of the songs, some of the songs that we hear on the radio. Um, And I'm not, like the other day, I was just, the song had a really good beat. I don't even know the name to it, but I was just like singing along and I'm just kind of like bouncing around in my car. And all (laughs) of a sudden when I realized what I was singing, I'm like, didn't it just say like, bitches and hoes and money? Like like, when I listened (laughs) to the actual lyrics, I'm like, oh my God, why? I can't like I can't believe that it's on the radio and it's popular that like when I I'm like man because I grew up like late 70s 80s you know there wasn't a lot of this stuff on the radio of like ev- all the content is about money and women and what I want to do to women and you know all these different things if you if you sift through a lot of the songs and it's like <sighs> is that really what you all you think about and 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 it's like a popular top 40 song and it's like yeah. but when you look at it it's like at the theme and the crux of it is 
women are my objects. Women make me feel good. And I'm not, you know, I know that we yeah. can probably debate this, but it's like, I feel like I'm almost feeling now, I literally used to dance to clubs in those with those songs. I love those songs. You know, I mean, Oh, girl, I know, me too. I, I, I probably still would if I was like in Chicago or something like that. But it's when I really listen Can to I the get lyrics. Out the gold heels? You know, yes. But it's like, wow. I mean, this is, it just, it still goes back to the, Men are superior to, to, to women. The, uh, the other day, and I told you this, I was walking into my condo, and shocker, here comes a Jeep full of dudes, and they just start whistling and hooting and hollering at me, like, hey, honey, I freaking put my bags down. <laughs> I go out to the freaking thing, the, the road. I put both of my middle fingers up, and I was like, go fuck yourself, you fucking asshole. I was just so pissed. And then they were just, they then were like, oh, fuck you, fuck you. And it was like this thing. And I was like, just fuck off, fuck off. And then I went back into my, you know, went into the condo. Thank God I have a security guard. <laughs> so uh, He was like, I'm not helping you. You're crazy. crazy. <laughs> but it's just like, I, here's the thing. Why did I do that? Again, anger. There's yeah. so much th- feelings that has been happening to me my entire life. And I, I can never, I feel like I can never do anything about it. And I did, and I also want to teach them a lesson. Now, what what I mean by that is, if you, part of the reason why the patriarchy exists is because there's no freaking consequence. You know, you they can just whistle away and keep on driving like, oh, we're so cool. P.S. You're absolutely not cool at all for doing that. Um, but I want them to get a negative association with that. You, you know, like maybe the next time. No, who, they're still talking who, about how great knows? it was. Who knows? Maybe, maybe, maybe they are. But maybe one guy in that car was like, "Wow, that was kind of a dick move." I yeah. mean, where, where do I don't go past a guy, and I find guys attractive all the time. I don't think it's oh, in, within my right. <laughs> I know you know. Okay, you know, but I, I don't yell it across the room. Like it's not within my right to do that. Okay, mm-hmm. so they though think. It's in my right to say whatever I want to the, to that female. I don't know who she is. Well, you I don't know, want your attention. It's the double standard. Like, why do they, why can they do that and we can't do that? Yes. We do that. We are we're crazy, right. we're crazy sluts or whatever. You know, you're. T- I, I I I don't even know why I think about this, but it's like I was so pissed off, right, when Mike Pence came out and said he doesn't have dinners or meetings and never takes a meeting with a female colleague alone, right? Because he must just be so sexually attractive and irresistible that any woman would basically jump him if given the opportunity, apparently. Um, But, you know, know. he just... He only said that because of his voters. Oh, my gosh. No, but, you know, he's he's so religious. Right. And his his wife, who he calls mother, that's fucked up. Stop it, really? Yeah, for real. Oh, my gosh. And they have like pet rabbits. They're weird. But he he's like, I don't take individual with meetings with women because, you know, I just can't can't open myself to those sorts of allegations. And I'm just like, number one, you're depriving women of business opportunities. That's mm-hmm. ridiculous. And number two, um, you're assuming that you're so sexually attractive that, you know, these women are going to just flock to you or make false accusations about you coming on to them if you just so happen to ever be alone with them. Um, and you know, that's not, it's not fair to women is this double standard is, is crazy. These, you know, what men do in one, one respect is cool and, and, you know, sexy and, um, admirable from all their like football playing buddies. But if you or I were to do that, we're a total horse, mm-hmm. right? I mean, oh, 100%. it's that. That double standard just doesn't sit well no. with me. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't like what it teaches our kids and our daughters, and I don't like what it, it teaches our sons. Mm-hmm. Um, well, it's very confusing from a sexual standpoint for women because we're like supposed to be, and I was raised Catholic, but we're like supposed to kind of hide our sexuality. Oh, in so many ways, <laughs> uh, you know, hide our sexuality. But meanwhile, we're growing sexually and experiencing all these things, but we don't really know what to do with it. And so it's like, are we supposed to hide it? And then it, is it our our fault? I remember um, hearing from a family member when I was younger going to mass that they've pulled women out of the communion line if they have clothes on that are too tight. And 
So I just That's remember so hearing that, you know, like hearing those messages over and over when I was growing up. And of course, I was like the rebel. So I was like, I don't give a shit what I like, whatever. I don't like communion anyways. But like that, <laughs> Does anyone? that I mean, <laughs> actually, those little wafers are kind of good. What? The little wafers are those not are bad. Awful. Really? I mean, if they're stale, it's like, oh, shit. It's the body of Christ. You better swallow all of it. <laughs> <laughs> but I just remember hearing that, and it's like, again, it kind of going back to like, oh, it's the women's fault. And no wonder. Well, not only I'm that. I'm even scared telling my story on this podcast. Like, if for some reason it got bad, like, I'm I'm still, like, have so much fear about just, uh, like, to your But that's point, how they keep you down. It's just, you're just telling the truth. Like, when right. that guy said to you, do you really want to ruin his life? P.S. He ruined his own goddamn life. Right. You're just owning the showing truth. reality. I'm just owning that's the truth. all it is. It's, and, it's, you know, I likened it to... The Wizard of Oz. Yes. Right? So I have Oz sitting back here behind a, a curtain, and I pull I pull back the curtain, and now mm-hmm. I'm the devil. Mm-hmm. Who's the devil? He is. Um, but it's that whole mentality that women exist or are put on the face of planet Earth to sexually gratify men mm-hmm. or gratify them in one way or the other. Right? Right. Um, you can't look good while waiting in line to get your communion wafer because— some dude might get a boner and he might not feel holy at that moment. Now that's your fault, not his fault. Right. Like you're you're responsible for the thoughts that go through these guys' heads. And that's insanity. It's insanity. Because number one, you're not. And number two, we could, you know, we could just wear burkas and they would still have those thoughts. Right. You know? Absolutely. Maybe even more so because they're like, oh, I wonder what's under that burqa. That's true. <laughs> I, mean, like, I mean, hello, Catholic schools. Right. Talk about what happens when boys are sexually repressed. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's a whole other story. That's a whole other story. Um, but you know, in and when you push back on that, and and, and you know, it's the whole Me Too movement. Mm-hmm. You know, when you push back on the oh. on the idea that we don't exist for your pleasure mm. or your gratification, they that's the narcissistic injury. Mm-hmm. They get angry. They, and that's when they lash out. They've been caught. They've been, they, we realize what's going on. So many guys that I know just randomly that are totally part of the patriarchy, you know, they embody the patriarchy. It benefits them. When I've been in the same room when the Me Too movement has, I know better than to Ugh. bring it up. I will not bring it up, but like it, it's when it, when it's brought up, their responses I know. make me sick to my stomach. They're like, oh, that damn me too women it's so stupid it's so ridiculous all those women just bitching about it they just like it literally is this is the issue and i have i talked to s about this over the weekend is that i read an article on how feminism actually contributes to the patriarchy and basically what he was saying and i'm like god that's actually sort of true is that when you when we stand up and we say something about how we feel about our experiences Oh, you're you're crazy. I mean, if you you know you think about like pictures of like the women who like have their tops off and they're like you know picketing with stuff and they've got hashtag Me Too taped on their boobs or whatever, like painted on their boobs, whatever they want to do. But guess what? The patriarchy loves that. I know because they look like crazy. Look bitches. at those crazy bitches. Yeah. Oh, look at those crazy bitches, and it causes more divisiveness. But, but you, we're allowing them so to de- right, to though. define what crazy is. Right. Well, unfortunately, they they kind of do. Yeah, they do to find that, and so that's this is this is why women don't speak up. Why we're afraid because when we do, like you said, oh my gosh, they just kick back and kick back and kick back harder, and it keeps things even more divided. So it's going to be a hard thing to break, you know, pull down the patriarchy. I know, and you know, and what bothers me too is the women who who contribute to it. Mm. I mean, I, I know I'm going to get sold out by a bunch of dudes, even if they think they're woke. What is what is that hashtag that a friend of ours keeps following conscious on Instagram? Men conscious men. She's like, these men are so sexy. I'm like, you can't just hashtag conscious man and be like, I'm a conscious man. I just <laughs> here's me standing <laughs> on really here's me doing a yoga pose on a rock. I'm so conscious. Yes. I'm so no. woke. <laughs> it means you like yourself on photo, like photography. I know, right? Yeah. But, you know, I, I, I expect it from men. And I think, you know, it, it's so incremental, the process of fighting against the patriarchy. But well, you don't expect it from women. And it's, it's fucked up. I mean, I'll, you know, I'll give you a for instance. I remember breastfeeding. This is back in the day. And men would just stare. Like, like that's super sexy. It's like my baby's giant head is not sexy, but all right. Um, but it was women. I have I have little boys right here. Are you going to do that right here? 
Mm-hmm. And I'm, you know, can you go do that in the bathroom? I don't know. Do you like to eat in the bathroom? Because my baby doesn't like to eat in the bathroom. <laughs> I mean, and it was always women who would come up and say, oh, do you really have to do that with like men around? My husband's right there or my kids mm-hmm. are right there. My son's right there and he can see your nipples. <laughs> I'm just like, first of all, no, he can't. But um, maybe a little, <laughs> maybe a <laughs> tiny bit for like a second. <laughs> um, but, you know, I just, it's, it's, the the women who push back on the fact mm. that this is you're being sexual. No, I'm not. Um, and who want to keep you in your place because if you don't, it upsets their little family mm. life. Um, and that's where I kind of get into the whole my whole spiel on marriage um, and being married. And I know this is not a popular opinion. <laughs> um, I like your opinion. You know, look. You know, marriage is cool for most people. I'm sure if you want to do it, you knock yourself out. I am all about equal rights. But, however, um, I have noticed a lot um, in, I guess I don't want to get into too much detail, but I've noticed a lot with women um, who are involved in my life where they get trapped in a, in a mm. marriage, and it's a cultural uh, thing. Yeah. And they feel like they can't extract themselves from it. And I look at marriage as an institution that was set up on, to, originally, if you read about it, to protect women because women didn't work and women couldn't own property. So the way to protect them and to protect their resources and their ability to care for their children should their husband be a dickwad and <laughs> run off with his secretary is this institution of marriage and allowing you 50% of their property or more than 50% of their property. Um, But we don't really have that so much anymore. Um, When women are independently Mm -hmm. uh, earning money and owning property, a lot they of can times, finally this, vote too. God, yeah, I, know, I, it? I know. I heard I mean, about why, that. Wow. I, I might just go register to vote one of I these know. days. I know. I can't yeah. believe we can I'm finally vote. vote for that Kamala Harris Gosh. thing. She seems real nice. <laughs> 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 so you know, I mean, uh, it's it's so hard for for women in these relationships now to extract themselves because now it's a legal process. Now mm-hmm. it's dividing assets, and the longer you have to expose yourself to. If you have a narcissist or a sociopath on the other end of your divorce proceeding, you are now exposed to at least six months of abuse and in, in, in fucking with the system to try to screw you over. Whereas without that marriage, you can walk. You can pack your shit and get the hell out of there. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I'm always cautious with friends of mine who are thinking about getting married. I'm thinking of one in particular. <laughs> um, I'm like, just think, just think about it. Because hey, I'm off for like a religious ceremony or a commitment proceeding, you know, ceremony. If, right, you, if you're right. religious, go ahead and do it. But when you tie your assets together, you better be damn sure that guy isn't psycho. Because <laughs> if he is, you're going to have a hell of a time getting away from him. That's the thing. It's like, it's it's hard to tell, especially when I, with these types of personality disorders, the thing I keep hearing over and over is, after we got married, things changed, or yes. after year two, or after, you know, like, they know that they have to hide it for a certain period of time mm-hmm. before the crazy actually comes out. And it's hard to really get to know someone fully. And then people can change and get really crazy. I... Yeah, well, it's, it's a patriarchal society, and yes. so everyone is so pro-marriage. Like, oh, right. you can't break up the marriage. You're married. You have children. And I'm like, you're getting abused every right. day. He treats you like shit. Right. Leave. Get out. Right? I mean, how many times do you need to get crabs to decide it's time that this, you know, this shit isn't for you? Right? And even when he gives you crabs 10 times, that's a bitch. Even a thing? It's, it's, it still takes six months to divorce him at a minimum. At least the state that we live in. Um, and I just— And then you have baby crabs at that point. Oh, too many. <laughs> oh my god! Oh my gosh! I knew a guy. This is total tangent. I knew a guy who who slept with two different women, two of his wife's friends, and the comment she had to me because he he had crabs or contracted crabs, and she's like, you know, now these two girls have crabs that are related. <laughs> it's like that's so gross. <laughs> It's another episode of Hobo Dad. Uh, yeah, that's another episode for sure. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, you know, and if you, you no matter how bad your scenario is, you can't just, or how abusive or what mm. kind of um, trauma is happening at home or what your kids are subjected to, you can't just pack your shit and leave. It's not that easy anymore. Um, Especially if you're religious, if you're in religion, oh, too, yeah. and you alluded to that. I know. When I hear that ridiculous statement of, well, 
you made a commitment. You, you uh, sure there's there's truth to that, but to basically guilt and shame people into like leave because they want to leave an abusive relationship because they pretty sure Jesus is fine. Jesus is like, you're good. I, hey, I've been I've been watching this whole thing up here and uh, you're, you're good. Yeah. I'll help you pack your bags. I'll send you a guardian angel. I mean, are you serious? It, and I just think that's part of uh, what the control, like controlling women. Yeah. You know? Well, you know, and it's, it's, it's just another platform for these guys to fuck with you. Right. Um, and I see it just stripping the power away. So, you know, when an individual one-to-one relationship with, you know, a sociopath, you realize that you have no, you have no agency, but women in general don't have agency. Mm. We are not allowed to form our own opinion and get the hell out. I mean, think about it. Think about that aunt. Everybody has that aunt who is with Jimmy and they never got married. Yeah, I and know. everybody and talks about aunt the Kathy never one. married Jimmy. That is just so weird. They've been yep. together for 34 years and she never married. I was like, good for Aunt Kathy because she can get the hell out when Jimmy drinks too much, right? Right, right. Like she can just leave. Right. Why would you ever marry him? It is it is funny though that they are looked at like the like the weird ones, like yeah. the weird one who didn't get married. Listen, the one in my family, they still don't invite Jimmy to Thanksgiving because she never married him. It's like Christmas, Thanksgiving. <laughs> like they still don't invite him as though they're not a couple because they never walk down the aisle. Oh, I mean so unfortunate. Oh, whereas the uh, you know, the 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 other aunt who met a guy online two weeks ago and married him on a cruise ship, he gets invited because <laughs> he got married. On a cruise ship. (laughs) I didn't even know that was a thing. That's kind of cool, too. Oh, yeah. But, I I mean, I think just back to the things that keep the patriarchy going and then— because it's, you know, when when you've been in a relationship with one of these types of people, you really do start to think to yourself, how do we stop this? How do we prevent this from happening? Because these people are horrific, and they they will literally take years and years of your your life. And— you know, I do think part of it does come down to a lack of of consequence. We had a mm-hmm. previous episode. We were talking about um, Joey Buttafuoco and John and John, John Wayne, Wayne Bobbitt. Bobbitt. So here's the thing, and I didn't mention this. I probably just didn't have time for it. But uh, when I, I was appalled when I was looking at his sentencing for, I mean, brutally, brutally, domestically violating his spouse, yeah. and it, he did it more than once. But his first sentence was 15 days, days. That's like a freaking extended vacation. Mm-hmm. I, I was like, did the guy also get like a free Manning and Petty in there? When he like, what? what is going on? That, probably got a that, free tattoo. I mean, he probably got a, <laughs> like, it's ridiculous though. That's one of the reasons why they don't have consequences. Mm-hmm. The legal system doesn't even see domestic violence as that big of a deal. Maybe that's changing. But I mean, that's, they, they, they know that they can get away with this stuff. Mm-hmm. And that needs to that needs to shift too, because you know the bro code, right? The bro code, the bro and code. the women are always crazy. But what the hell is that? You know, when you meet a guy who tells you all his exes are crazy, run, run. Oh yeah, run. I mean, yeah. Oh, you Red know, flag. I, I, you know, I see it all the time when they, you know, they, they they're going to into court on these sentencing, and you know, it's always like. Eh, she's a little nuts. So, you know, she, it, it takes two to tango. It's a two-person thing. It's just not all one-sided. And I get it. Like, I get that there's two sides to every story, but sometimes one person is way shittier than the other person. It yeah. just is. Yeah. Um, and it isn't always the guy. It right. isn't. But in these abuse situations, it's you see these women who are fighting all of the power. They're fighting the family structure. They're fighting their religious structure. They're fighting the societal structure. And my concern, I mean, I literally have two female acquaintances right now who know that we're doing this podcast, who know what I've been through because I've been talking to them. And I've been talking openly because f- fight the power, <laughs> right? Um, who are struggling to get out and they don't see a way out. And if you know, I, I don't know the answer to that. I would love to have this answer for them, but the answer is like, just get the hell out. Right. Just that, and that's the elevator pitch, right? When you're stuck in the elevator with this dick who's mm. groping you and taking advantage of you or trying to get you to come back to his room, the old, there is nothing to say. Right. You'll never change his mind. You'll never change society, but you need to get the fuck out of the elevator. Mm-hmm. Get out. Mm-hmm. And I want to tell these two female friends in particular, I'm like, get out. There's no, th- not. Nothing will ever ever change. 
There's no marriage therapy that will make him respect you. Um, there is no counseling that you can, you or he can reach um, or, or utilize that will make him a better or a different person. He's been this person for 20 some years probably or his whole life. He's not changing. Uh, there's no drug. There's no treatment. Um, the, you can't guilt him into it, talk him into it. You're not going to give a guy with no moral compass a moral compass. Right. It's not going to happen. Um in in they don't know what they don't know. They've lived in that literal prison, right, for so long that they don't know how to get out of there. And they don't know what it's like on the other side. It's like living in jail your whole life. You don't know what you don't you don't want to get out of jail because you don't know what's out there. Yeah. And it's so funny, like just to mention that because I've been this whole thing has been equated to me a lot of times with like Stockholm syndrome. You start identifying with your abuser and mm -hmm. you don't know what life would be like without your abuser. You've never experienced life without him and you don't you don't know what you would do. Um right. and it's so hard to convey to these women that it's better. It's better. You don't know mm -hmm. it, but I promise you it's better. Right. Um, <clears throat> and so, you know, I just, you know, I want to utilize the podcast. I want to utilize all the relationships that we've built in the community to try to help these people get the fuck away from these guys. Yeah. And, and leave are, them with no more supply. Right. You know, and right. that's the other thing. You share your story and you start talking about these people. And one thing you can do is whittle away at their supply. Because the more people who know what he does and what he's capable of, the less women or the fewer women that are willing to get involved with them mm -hmm. right and there are places to go and there are resources in place for women who are trying to leave i mean physically abusive relationships unfortunately emotional abuse is so tough because it's so tough it's that's the, the worst you know it is really the worst but if you take it one day at a time and just do the best that you can do so how would you fight the patriarchy um I besides what you're doing day. right now <laughs> i fight it every day um I mean, the thing about it is you just have to, like, everything that's huge is just take it in chunks. Day by day, do what you can. These Me Too, Me Too movements, I mean, start another one, you know? I mean, for me, it's just, like, making people aware, you know, at my organization, around me, if, they, if something is said. Um, I haven't always spoken up because I, I was afraid of how I was going to be viewed, and I was afraid I would look too feminine in a world of men professionally. And quite honestly, this podcast has given me its like ownership on my voice, and I already yeah. have started speaking up, just really in my own way. I just do it with my personality, but I just mentioned, you know, that comment. Like, let me let me tell you how I experienced that comment. Mm -hmm. And just sort of like reframe it. Because I think sometimes they it's so inherent, patriarchy is so inherent that they, people don't even realize they're making comments um, and, and what that would mean. So I actually had a conversation with a family member of mine and um, very recently, and I was basically attacked um, in a restaurant, verbally attacked. And it was all about the patriarchy. And I was, they're like, you're this bleeding feminist and you hate men and all these things. And I said, let me tell you how this really is for me. And then I explained it, and they actually understood it. I, I'm not trying to, am I going to change them? That's not my responsibility. I'm just here to, to give them maybe a different view of, of what it's like in, in my position as a, as a female. And I think that they, like, they listen. And, you know, it's like you start in your community with the people who you know, the people who you love. I don't know if I would, I'm not the type of person, I'm not going to go down to Trump Right now, with my boobs out, being like, "Hey, me too, Trump." What do you? What do you know? What? That's I not, might do that. I see I you would. would. Do that. <laughs> I wouldn't. Um, I'm not there. Might not ever be there. But so, whatever your personality is, do it. You have a voice, and you're. We we are somewhat protected by society, by the law, by you know communities. I mean, it's like just do it. Say what you want to fucking say. Well, and you know, I think the one thing that I've sort of, you know, kind of grabbed onto is. We may not be able to fight the current patriarchy because it's so entrenched and they're yeah. old. But guess what? Nobody lives forever and granddad is going to die. And what we can do, because thankfully we are still probably the gender that is more responsible for raising children. So maybe we can do our best not to raise more narcissists. Mm. Maybe we can stem yes. the ties. Um And we can raise a generation of yeah. little boys who don't turn into such dickwad men who abuse women or, or view women as their plaything. Right. Teach respect for women yeah. emotionally, but take care of yourself. Pa parents need to take care of yourself emotionally. If you emotionally abandon yourself as a parent, you're going to emotionally abandon your kids. 
So it's like, take care of yourself first. They say it like it's just, and it's so cliche, but it's very true. Give oh, yeah, what is, the, what, what, is, they need. what is the analogy, being the in an airplane. airplane and putting your own... Yeah, I would never. I'm sorry if that thing's going down. I'm like, I'm so we're all, we're all screwed. I wouldn't think <laughs> about that. I wouldn't be like, oh my god, here, let me put it on first. I'd be like, shit, we're just all gonna die. I just think that's so stupid. Anyway, um, yeah, the metaphor is stupid, but in reality, I think it makes sense. So, <clears throat> <laughs> so yeah, I mean, <clears throat> coming full circle with the elevator. What do you do about the guy in the elevator? Um, I guess you kick him in the balls. Yeah. You kick him in the balls and you get the fuck off the elevator and that's your elevator pitch. Um, and it's not your fault. And it's not your fault and not you don't let them try to skew the narrative the next day. Yep. Um, maybe when they say, hey, let's not tell people about this, you say, no, I'm going to tell everybody. <laughs> <laughs> see how that goes And, and then over. run. And, and then, run. <laughs> or not. Or, you know, just see what happens. <laughs> right, um, right. So, yeah. All right. Thanks for listening. Yeah, thanks for joining us. And hey, we have an Instagram under S and M Podcast. If you want to take a look at inst- our uh, account there and check out our content, leave us a message or shoot us a, an instant message. We, we we respond to everybody who isn't spam. So thank you, <laughs> thank you. <laughs>